I'm going to start with the same sentence with which I will end. Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might have this wish I wish tonight. My odyssey, such as it is, started by being the first kid in my whole extended family that ever went to college. I managed to get myself a full ride to Cambridge. I got a bachelor's, I got a master's. I came out and discovered to my shock, my horror, that there was no ready market for a master's in English literature, at least that I could find. So after banging around a little bit in the UK, I emigrated to Los Angeles because I read about this thing called the American Dream, all about give us your huddled masses, and I figured I can be a huddled mass. And so I came to LA, discovered nobody was terribly interested in English literature there either. However, there was this thing called the motion picture industry, and I managed to incrementally work my way up in that business as a motion picture producer. And rapidly, because in America we promote much faster than in Europe, I became a producer of over 25 years, 25 films every year. The ultimate entrepreneurial task, have the idea, get the script written, hire the director, raise the capital, hire the cast, make the film, sell it, move on to the next, the following year. Uh, Arlington Road, Wild, Tom and Viv, and a film which I know is particularly emotional and meaningful for everyone in this room, I produced Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> but the turning point in my life, the epiphany if you like, and I do believe that life pivots, it doesn't actually go in a straight line, was that in 1983, I was introduced by my cousin to an 11-year-old little boy who was dying of a brain tumor in a hospital in London. And his great wish in life was to come to Southern California and do the Disney thing, etc. And really knowing no better, uh, we brought him over. And he, his mom, the cousin, uh, moved into my condominium. It was back in my single days. And in two weeks, we did everything that you definitely are not supposed to do with a seriously ill child. He had a wonderful time. He went home to London. We felt we had been given a great gift. And a few weeks later, little Sean died. It was very sad, but that was not the epiphany. The epiphany was this. I had a business lunch with a commissioning editor from HBO. And I tried to sell him some project which you know, by the salad he had rejected, as is mostly the case. And he asked me the question, so what else is new and exciting in your life? And I told him the story of Sean. And this gentleman in a suit and tie from HBO cried. And that was one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given. It was at that moment incredibly embarrassing. You know, men are idiots. We don't know how to deal with a man weeping next to one. Um, so I gave him a hug, and I remember going down in the elevator and thinking, ha, this is a very powerful narrative. I have to do something with this. So I called a meeting, and I said, look, this is what we just did. There must be a lot of sick kids. Maybe we could do it again. And so we did. That was functionally the first meeting of the Starlight Children's Foundation. I won't tell you any of the last 30 years, but I will tell you this, because we've just had to work out the stats, because September is our 30th birthday party. In those years, we have served 60 million families through our 50-odd uh, offices in six countries. Um, and the real mind-boggling one, I don't understand numbers that begin with a B. Uh, I have no idea, you know, I'm, I'm with the Papua New Guinea tribe whose counting goes one, two, three, a lot. Uh, we have actually raised and also spent on seriously ill children and their happiness over a billion dollars over that period. So that's Starlight. Comes along 1991. And I decided that I should meet Steven Spielberg. I was introduced 
to his assistant's assistant's assistant, and I was told yes, that I could have my 15 minutes, and I pitched up, up at Amblin, and it's pretty intimidating, and I was reminded that I only had 15 minutes. So in I go, and I'm saying to Stephen, I think we should make film, video, for seriously ill kids, specialized, to lift them up, to make them happier, to educate them. Stephen said, well, of course we should. What do you want me to do? And I'm looking at my watch, and I'm thinking, ah, well, I've been in here 45 minutes. I've been in here an hour and a half. I wonder what happened to the next meeting. In any event, Stephen said, whatever you want. I said, OK, you be the chairman. It's a new uh, nonprofit, a 501c3. He said, what do you want to call it? I said, OK, Starlight Starbright. So um, on the way out, he said, you know, if we're going to raise money, I should give some. I said, that'd be great. He said, how much do you think I should give? I said, I, I'm not going to tell you what to give. I think you should give something moderately painful. He said, <laughs> he said uh, no, you can't leave unless you give me a number. And I had one of those out of body moments where I saw my mouth say, two and a half million dollars? And I saw his mouth say, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so I came out, I went behind a tree, I called my wife, and I said, I think I just hallucinated, but this is what I think. And there was a silence, and she said, do you think you're safe to drive, or should I come and get you? <laughs> I want you to know that when we turned on Starbright World, Stephen and Norman Schwarzkopf and I, in June of 1995 at Digital World, it was the world's first fully interactive social network with video chat, with avatars, with text, uh, operating in multiple children's hospitals. It has never been turned off since. And let me just point out that when we turned it on in 95, Mark Zuckerberg was 11 years old, just saying. So once you've done two of these things, I, it's like a film. Yeah, well, there's probably a third one. I got really angry about foster kids and what happens to foster kids, and I formed the third one in Washington, D.C. Starlight, Starbright, First Star. It'll be called First Star. And First Star does two basic things and has done since 1999. Uh, one is to embarrass the broken bureaucracies around the country by shining a bright light on their... Um, inept and subpar uh, performance by comparing them with the places that do a much better job. We do that by assigning school grades, A through F, and having a great big press conference with a lot of earned media, the Associated Press, we usually do the meeting on Capitol Hill, and it gets you the newspaper headline, we flunked, drives the legislators crazy, they phone the bureaucrats, they say, how did we get an F? They're up the road, they got an A minus. We did that for eight, nine years, at which point one of my board members said, you know that the most um, difficult kids to place in individual families are the teenagers. Nobody wants them. They go into these dreadful group homes, and then they come out and the stats are lousy. The actual stats out of foster care, 31% of American 12th graders go on to get a bachelor's. The comparable stat for foster kids, 3%. Two-thirds of our young men out of foster care are incarcerated within two years, and one-third of our young ladies. It is uh, half of them, almost half, are homeless within two years. It is a 500,000 young person challenge, and it's the last great civil rights struggle that never even started in America, because by definition, these are Americans who have no money. They have no ability to self-advocate. Most of everything is secret, and uh, why would it ever change? And it's all balkanized. So um, she said, if we've got to have these group homes, why couldn't we put one somewhere good? And I said, like, where? And Kathleen Reardon, Dr. Reardon, said to me, well, what if it was in the middle of the campus of a four-year university? What would you have then? I said, well, so ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, it's a high school. They live there. They have role models, 25,000 role models. Uh, it's the older kid saying to the younger kid, why would you want to work in McDonald's your whole life? I'm going to be an architect. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to go into business. And then you've got all the experts. How many psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists, social worker, educate? You have everything. And then you've got pride. You have, come on, 
You're, you're, you're one of us now. You need to behave yourself. Do your homework. We'll help you. And here's your T-shirt, and you're one of us. So it's family for kids who are devoid of family. So I went and got a meeting with the chancellor and vice chancellor of UCLA, Jean Block and Yanina Montero. And uh, I pitched this idea, and they said yes in the meeting. And therefore, in 2011, in the month of July, we interviewed uh, 100 rising ninth graders, chose 30 and five on a waiting list. Then we decided that was mean, so we let them in as well. <laughs> we, we rented a sorority right there at UCLA. Uh, our kids are now finishing their second full year, so they're rising 11th graders. It's like watching flowers grow. So that's first star, and you're going to see a little piece of video in a moment. And then just because, you know, three's not enough, uh, I decided that I was scared of homeless people, and it bothered me. And I found in my life <laughs> that if you're scared of something, you actually should just suck it up. You can't be a film producer if you're scared, because everything's scary. They all say no, and they want you to go away and leave them alone. You just have to muscle through. So I decided I would interview homeless people. So I did 62 interviews on my bicycle around West LA. And I asked them a bunch of questions, but especially, where would you go and sleep at night? Turns out, 75,000 homeless people in the most recent census, and there's only about 15,000 beds. So any way you cut it, there's 40, 50, 60,000 people sleeping rough. And the epiphany was the old lady who said, I'll show you my house. And she took me onto the scrubland next to the San Diego freeway, and there was this huge cardboard box. And on the side, it said sub-zero. And I thought, huh, here's the epiphany. Here's that moment. Thank you. She's living in the cardboard box, but I got the refrigerator. What's wrong with this picture? So I was going to build a shelter, but it's too expensive. If it's $50,000 per bed when you build the building, per bed that you generate, and there's 60,000 homeless people, that's $3 billion, no clue how you raise that. So I thought, I wonder what's the best we can do with 500 bucks. So I ran a competition at the Pasadena Art Center College of Design for the best you could do in shelter on wheels for 500 bucks. That's called EDAR. Everyone deserves a roof. So it's a thriving charity now, and we have 300 people on Skid Row in LA who sleep in EDARs. So then I met Jeff Skoll. Jeff Skoll had um, sold his interest in eBay and had decided to make the world a better place through media. And someone suggested he should meet me, and we met. And he said, come on my board. I'm doing this thing called participant media. It is pro-social media. And I thought, well, I know the pro-social. I know the film. Why wouldn't I do that? So there were three of us for the first five, six years on that board. And we did it. But the frustration of being on a board of directors is you don't actually do it. You get to say to the people who are doing it on staff, well done, that's brilliant, congratulations, and here's an idea. But you don't actually do it. So what has happened after coming off the board, I think I was on seven years, is I've increasingly been, I've worked out how to teach pro-social media. How do you move someone's heart because the core of everything worth doing and that one can do in the world, especially pro-socially, is through emotion. Move someone's heart and then quickly give them an action point, and that will result, you hope, in making the world a better place. So I've now codified this into a plan for what I'm calling Aspire, the Academy for Social Purpose in Responsible Entertainment, or if you prefer, and you're academic, the Academy for Social Purpose in Responsible Education. Uh, it's my acronym, so it can stand for whatever I want it to stand for. <laughs> so why can't one have a dual purpose acronym? I couldn't see a good reason. I'm not quite ready to say which university we are partnering with, but the negotiations are going very well. I do believe that we can teach pro-social media to undergrad and grad students, that we can offer student support and scholarships to those from underprivileged backgrounds under a great bargain where we say to them, you come here, we'll put you through school, and then you go back to the Navajo Nation, you go back to South Central, you go back to the Bronx, and you use your new audiovisual skills to lift up your people. That's the grand bargain. 
I also think that we need to study the history of pro-social media, who's ever done it, and the huge issue, what is efficacy? Who's actually making the world a better place, and who would have done better to give the money to the nonprofit that is actually doing the work? You, you ought to believe that you're going to have a multiplier uh, if you're going to use media to improve things. So um, Aspire is my third act. Uh, I thought um, I would just mention the opportunity and the challenge for young people, everybody sitting here who's under the age of 30 and a few. I think it is this. Uh, we have given you, my generation, we've given you a bum rap. We have given you an inheritance, honestly, where um, it's challenging. I think we have incrementally more challenges in America, in our cities, in the world, on the planet, than those that were received by my generation. I apologize. I also see you coming out of school with abundant debt. And those of you who've gone on to a grad degree, I see, yay, even more debt. But I think you are the most capable generation in the 8,000-year history of civilized man. And that is for two reasons. And I'm counting on you to make your world, which is mine as well, a better place. And I do believe you have the tools and the ability to do so. First of all, you are digital. I am a digital immigrant, but you are digital natives. I have had to learn digital in all its ramifications as a second language, but you have spoken it virtually from birth. That has some ramifications to your ability to improve your world and your own life. The first of which is geography has been annihilated. It means that you can crowdsource your partners, your financiers, uh, your retail customers, the people that you need to persuade over great distances. Secondly, your digital ability gives you access to all the knowledge in the world. If it's there, you can click your way through it, and you can rapidly wiki your way to knowing what anyone else knows and how they opine on whatever is the issue that you are researching. Me, I had to climb up a ladder at Cambridge and go to a high stack in the library, and whatever book I was reading, I wasn't reading another one simultaneously. You, you're hyperlinked. Furthermore, you have crowdsourcing to find the people who share your aspirations, your dreams, your ability to make the world a better place. But the biggest single thing that's different about you is that you are the most pro-social generation since the late 1930s. It's been abundantly researched. 85% of young Americans will change brand if they are confronted with a proposition that is pro-social on brand B and they approve of it. That is huge. It means you have economic power. You volunteer more hours per month in your 20s uh, than either of the two prior generations. You care. You are passionate. The young people who spend the day before and all night setting up events when we have one for Starlight or First Star, they're not there for the Diet Coke and the cold pizza. They're there because it is who they are. It's in their water. It's in their DNA. That is you. I believe that through your digital abilities, very interesting, you think about this question. When in the history of humanity has any younger generation known more about any subject than the older generation? I think it is now, I think it is you, and it is everything digital. Go into your average home, and when the young people come home on vacation from college, one of them is asked to please fix the blue screen of death. The other one has to program the DVD player. Uh, you, you, you guys are the center of knowledge, and what you don't know yourselves, you can pull from the ether in nanoseconds. The question is what you do with it, and I think that's where your eleemosynary, your pro-social instinct is spot on. The world is beset by challenges. We need to work together to make the world a better place, and significantly, we can. And in doing that, we make our own lives more enriched. We lift ourselves up. Man never stands so tall as when he stoops to hold the hand of a child in need. I am going to close with a piece of video. I have hundreds of videos. But I'm showing you three things with this video. The first thing is, this is a piece of media that was finished from post-production on Friday evening of 
a week ago. So what is that? Um, eight days ago. In that eight days, we've raised $200,000 with this video. I put it to you that the narrative, the emotion, the authenticity, and the faces of those who are in it uh, is the essence of moving the needle and making the world a better place. And the camera in this context is much stronger than a gun because it is with the camera that we can bring people along. We can have them be aware, alert, enabled, and wishing to make the world a better place. I also, with this video, I want to introduce you to my foster kids. I have 30 foster kids who live on the campus at UCLA. We've also replicated the foster academies, the first star academies. They're at the University of Rhode Island in Kingston. We're also at the University of Connecticut, at George Washington University in DC, and we're working on four more campuses. This is going to be a very big thing. We are in, I think, a decade going to change totally the outcomes from foster care. We think all our kids are going to college of one kind or another, most of them to four year. That will be a heck of a lot more than the 3%, which is the stat that we have to beat. So my closing line to you before we roll the video is to say, if you are a young person, you're Gen Y, you're a millennial, I urge you to think about your own route to personal success and to your engagement with the life force and with your society, not just by go get a job with somebody else, but also by thinking through your ability to be an entrepreneur, and especially the bit of it that I understand perhaps the best is how you can use your digital skills as a, uh, an accelerator and a multiplier as leverage to make your world a better place. My wish is that you pay attention to that and that as a result of you being on Earth, you leave the world a better place than the one that you inherited. Starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might have this wish. I wish tonight. Please meet my foster kids. A quarter of foster kids are homeless after they age out of the system. A third of our girls and two thirds of our young men end up in prison after aging out of foster care. Roughly a third of American 12th graders go on to get a bachelor's. But the comparable stat is 3% of foster kids. My name is Rosario. My name is Justin. My name is Sarah. My name is Tiffany. My name is Kenneth, and I attend the UCLA First Star Brewer and Gardner Scholars Academy. The UCLA Garden Scholars Academy is a program that supports students in high school who are in foster care. We are an academic program in that we are trying to get our students to college, but I think the foundation of our program is that we are family. We think we can dramatically increase the number of these kids who go to college and thrive in college. These kids are our responsibility, and I feel that uh, First Star is one of the few organizations that really respects them and honors them as full citizens and humans uh, deserving of all the rights and protections that that we are lucky enough to have. A word I would use to describe First Star would be a family. The people who are here inspire me to be who I want to be. They inspire me to go to college. They inspire me to be open, to be able to share, and just to be all that you can be. I practically run up to hug everyone. <laughs> My parents would say they don't want me. And when I came here, it felt like family. <laughs> For the first time, I had something. I have something to look forward to. I have an opportunity to get out of my group home and go back to my family. I do feel completely safe here. This is something that foster kids deserve. My goals are to go through college, and I want a double major uh, in kinesiology and language. I'm thinking more about 
forensic science. I want to teach people. That's all I want to do. I want to become a veterinarian when I grow up. I will be a student at UCLA majoring in criminal minds or psychiatry. I don't know. I'm still deciding. I will be graduating probably from UCLA with a master's or a bachelor's. I'm a bird. When I graduate from high school, I'm coming to UCLA. Every foster kid deserves a chance like this to be around people who care about them so much. It's just, it's amazing. Everybody has the chance to do whatever they want and has the opportunity to move on in life. And you don't have to worry about one less thing. I, um, I brought a pocket full of business cards. I mean it seriously that I'm the last speaker. I'm gonna stand right over there with my pocket of business cards. If you'd like one, I'd be honored to share it and to take yours. Thank you.